incredibly fitting that on this particular moment, in this particular day, as we honor our military, that we would have the great Tim Lee back with us. An American hero, a recipient of the Purple Heart, a man who lost his legs in Vietnam serving our country, a man who continues to fight even a greater battle as a pastor, travels 100,000 miles a year from place to place sharing the gospel, who's had an incredible impact on the life of so many of us in this room, is our honored guest today. I got a text a little while ago from one of our very own students that's in the room here, Ethan Brown, who told me, he said, Pastor David, my father accepted his call into ministry when Tim Lee was preaching. It's because of Tim Lee that my father today is in the ministry. That is evidence in this very room that Tim Lee not only continues to have an impact into the life of this generation, but continues to show a legacy into the life of our very own moms and our dads. As long as I am here, Tim Lee will always have a place here at Liberty University in our convocation schedule. And I want you to know that. There are very few people, there are very few people who get to come here every single year. A lot of times God uses someone in a, in a tremendous way, like we saw Dion Joseph, and as soon as they walk off stage, we just go, can you come back? But there are a very few people that we know every year, whether it's a Jonathan Falwell or a Tim Lee, we must put before our students. If a student is with us for four years, we want them to hear and sit under the preaching of Tim Lee four different times. And I tell you that to say that um, as many times as he's been here, as much as we have always loved to sit under his teaching, this is one of those rare, rare moments where he has brought his family and his three beautiful granddaughters are here with us. And so this year is a very special year. Can, you, can, can we just uh, acknowledge the, the presence of uh, just Tim Lee's family and his granddaughters? Thank you all. Yeah. We want you to know, and in, in, in front of uh, just everybody here, we, we want you, sir, to know in front of your wife and your grandkids that you are a stakeholder in the school. You're not just on our board of directors, your pastor who prays. I can't tell you, I get texts from this man, I, we get on the phone and labor over decision making for your life. Um, I can't tell you the hours and hours and hours that this man pours into your life that you don't even see. And um, we're just blessed to have him. We really, really are. And we wanted to say in front of your family, sir, um, we are just indebted to you and we love you. Can we just put our hands together for the great Tim Lee? Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. You may be seated, and it is a joy to be back at uh, Liberty University, one of my all-time uh, favorite places to go to, and uh, we've been uh, coming uh, here since uh, 1985. I believe it was the first time, and Dr. Jared Falwell uh, Sr. was a dear friend of ours and uh, invited me uh, to speak at Thomas Road Baptist Church and at Liberty University on many, many occasions. And then in 1991, I had the privilege to uh, start begin serving on the Board of Trustees uh, here at Liberty, and I've been on that uh, board ever since. And I just came from that uh, board meeting, and I can tell you I would much rather be here with you than to be with them. All right, anyhow. And, uh, but it is exciting. I know David's uh, pointing toward my family, but I want you to see my family, Connie and uh, Emma and Allie and Sarah. Would you all stand up down there? Come on, stand up. I want to embarrass you a little bit. Now you can see them. Woohoo! Yeah. Connie and I have been married now for 43 years. We have three wonderful children. Uh, Brian and Janet and Amber, and all three of them love the Lord. They've all three grown up, and they all three left home. Amen. That's, 
It's a great thing, but the thing that has turned our lives upside down are our six grandchildren. This is the most exciting thing in the world. I used to think grandparents were nuts. I'd have complete strangers come to me and say, would you like to see a picture of my grandchildren? Why? <laughs> Years ago, I'm not kidding you, people put bumper stickers on the back of their car that said, ask me about my grandchildren. So 70 miles an hour, I was supposed to roll down my window and talk to them about their grandkids. They have all kinds of bumper stickers. You know, they got the one that says, my kid is an honor student. I saw one in Dallas, true story, said, my kid goes to school. <laughs> well, that's good. I want to do something very quickly this morning, and some of you will uh, identify with what I'm about to tell because I brought you up to date a little bit when I was here the last time. But for some of you, this is brand new. And they're, you're going to enjoy it, you're going to rejoice and get excited about what I'm about to tell you. I received a phone call uh, two and a half, almost three years ago now from a chaplain at Paris Island. If you're going to be an enlisted Marine, uh, for the Marines that are in the building today, happy early birthday. But if you're going to be an enlisted Marine, you go to either uh, MCRD San Diego or MCRD Paris Island. Normally it depends on which side of the Mississippi River you're from, not always, but normally. And uh, Chaplain Benefield had actually heard me speak when he was a teenager in St. Charles, Missouri, and now he's a chaplain in the Marine Corps, and asked me if I would be interested in coming and speaking to the uh, Marine recruits. I've spoken at a lot of military bases and camps and installations over the year. Most of the time, they're what I call a gratuitous type invitation. They want me to come and talk for five minutes and give me some kind of award. And I'm not totally against that, but the older I get, the less appeal that those things have for me. I just want to see people saved. I want to see lives changed uh, for God's glory. He assured me that that was not what this was. It was what they call Sunday morning. Protestant chapel, I would have between an hour and a half to two hours with no restrictions. I said, well, I don't get that kind of liberty some churches I go to. And so uh, <clears throat> he said, we'll have to go through and get it all approved and set up. Uh, the last hurdle that they had to cross was the CO of the base had to prove for me to come for the first time in the history of Paris Island. They had a female commanding officer, Brigadier General Lori Reynolds about six foot four, and she looks like a Marine. <clears throat> and uh, she has raised a Catholic her entire life. And uh, a couple of years ago, she was invited to a ladies' Bible study. They were studying the Gospel of John, and for the first time in her life, she understood what the Gospel was, and she got saved. And now she's in a position to make a decision to whether I'm going to come and speak to these recruits. They showed her a DVD of me speaking at Prestonwood Baptist Church in Dallas. They said she had tears in her eyes and said, yes, our recruits I need to hear him. And we were there two weeks ago. That was our 10th event. Uh, every time that I go to speak, it's a brand new recruit class. And uh, the last time was maybe the lowest number that we had, probably 3,000 or 31, 3,200 recruits. The time before that, on August the 2nd, we had right at 4,500 recruits. We bring in our own worship team, Mark Ivey, the great worship leaders in America. They bring the A team from Jacksonville, Florida. They don't bring the B team, they bring the A team. They come in and they lead worship for 45 to 50 minutes. It's unbelievable to hear 4,000 recruits singing, God's not dead. It'll put goosebumps on top of your goosebumps. And then I get up and speak, and then I give a public invitation. And I told them that I wanted to give an invitation. I've never understood the sense in not giving an invitation when you preach a gospel message. It's like taking a starving man into the best buffet in town and showing him all that great food, and then not giving him an opportunity to eat it. Doesn't make a bit of sense. So we give an invitation every time we go. And so far, we we have seen right at 16,000 recruits who have left their seats and came forward and gave their heart to Jesus Christ. It has truly been a God thing. In the midst of a bad world, everything seems to be going wrong. Men, people getting their heads chopped off, people being burned alive in animal cages, uh, students having guns pointed at their head and asked if they're a Christian, and all kinds of other atrocities and problems 
This is a God thing. It's not only great for the short haul, the fact that these young recruits are now a Christian and off the road to hell and on the road to heaven, but the fact that five and six, seven years from now, if the Lord tarries is coming, there'll be leaders uh, in the Marine Corps and then leaders in America. And it's like God's saying, I want to see a lot of uh, Marines get saved here at one time. And another miracle just happened on the day before. Yesterday I was at home and I talked to a chaplain at San Diego where the other recruit base is and understanding what was going on at Paris Island and now they've already invited us to come in January and they're talking about doing long-term events at San Diego as well. This is a God thing. And I told you that to ask you primarily to pray. And there is a way that you can help. You can go online, timlee.org, and read more about uh, this ministry. You can also uh, follow us uh, uh, on Twitter at Marine Tim Lee. And I tell people uh, that if you're easily offended, if you're thin-skinned, if you don't love Jesus and you don't love America, you will not enjoy following me on Twitter. I didn't go 10,000 miles away from home, give two legs for my country to come back here and be politically correct while America's being destroyed. If I would fight for America in Vietnam, I'll fight for America here at home. But Ollie North wrote a book called American Heroes on the Home Front. It's a war story book. It's not a Christian book. It's a war story book. It's a great book for veterans. Some of you, uh, a great Veterans Day gift for your father or maybe a brother or uh, even a sister served in the military. And uh, uh, those uh, are Iraq and Afghanistan, American heroes and their story. He realized it was the 50th anniversary of the start of the Vietnam War. He wanted to put a Vietnam story in it. They chose our story. And we're honored and humbled. So that story is in the book as well. Now you go to Barnes & Noble or other bookstore, you'll pay, fit, or you'll pay $30 for the book. But we have a special on them today. They're $50. You're smarter than some crowds I go to. This, this is a fundraiser. We, every time we go, it's nineteen dollars to $20,000 to put on these events. Plus, we're always there on Sunday morning. There's no love offerings. There's no honorarium. So this is a way for us to raise money. You get the book for $50. Our books have Ollie North's signature in them. If you don't know who Ollie is, uh, you need to find out. He's an American hero. He's a dear friend of ours. And he signed them. I'll be glad to sign them. They're right down here on the front. And then uh, also we have the uh, flag pins like I wear on my lapel, the American flag and the Marine flag. That's the best pin that we have. To show you we're not totally biased, we have the, uh, uh, all the other branches of the military as well, the Army, the Navy, the Air Force, the Coast Guard. We also have the Don't Tread on Me. If you don't know what that is, you need to look that up as well. And then we have the pin with the American flag and the Christian flag. That's a great one. Those pins are $10 each. You get it free with each book that you buy. You can write a check, make it out to TLM, you can put it on a major card, and of course you can pay cash as well. I wanted to say that up front because I don't want to be a distraction of them when get ready to leave here today. I will be down front, McConnie will be there, my granddaughters will be there as well to help you after the service. I want to read, and I come to you with a heavy burden this morning about my country, about America. And you remember when I say these things, the investment that I've made in this land. And I believe I've gathered the right to be able to say some of the things that I'm going to say uh, here uh, in this convocation in the next few brief moments. In chapter 2 of the book of Jeremiah, listen to this, and I brought you into a plentiful country to eat the fruit thereof and the goodness thereof. But when you entered, you defiled my land, and you made my heritage an abomination. You know what they were doing? They were kicking God out of their country. Verse 11, hath the nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods? But my people have changed their glory, for that which doth not profit. Verse 13, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hew them out cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. They were kicking God out of their land in the book of Lamentations. Let me read just a few verses in chapter number 1 in verse 1. How does the city set solitary that was full of people? How has she become as a widow, she that was great among the nations and princes among the provinces? How is she become 
tributary. Verse 7, Jerusalem remembered in the days of her affliction and of her miseries all her pleasant things that she had in the days of old, when her people fell into the hand of the enemy, and none did help her. The adversary saw her and did mock at her and her Sabbaths. They were kicking God out of their country. Chapter 2 and verse number 15. All that pass by clap their hands at thee, they hiss and wag their head at the daughter of Jerusalem, saying, Is this the city that men call the perfection of beauty, the joy of the whole earth? All thine enemies have opened their mouth against thee. They hiss and gnash the teeth. They say we have swallowed her up, and certainly this is the day that we look for, we have found, and we have seen it. And then in chapter number 4 and verse 12, the kings of the earth and all the inhabitants of the world would not have believed that the adversary and the enemy should have entered into the gates of Jerusalem for the sins of her prophets and the iniquities of her priests that have shed the blood of the just in the midst of her. And then the prophet Jeremiah sums all of it up. The book of Jeremiah, the book of Lamentations, he puts it all together in chapter number 5. I don't have time to read the entire chapter, but three or four verses. Listen, our inheritance is turned to strangers. Our houses to aliens. You've taken what God has given you, you've given it to the enemy. Verse 6, we've given the hand to the Egyptians and to the Assyrians to be satisfied with bread. Our fathers have sinned and are not, and we have borne their iniquities. And then he says in verse number 15, the joy of our heart is ceased, and our dance is turned into mourning. And then the key verse. Verse number 15, the crown is fallen from our head. Woe unto us that we have sinned. I don't preach this message today so much for the sake of my generation. I haven't totally given up on my generation, but my burden and my, this message today is not so much for them. It's not even so much for my children's generation as it is for your generation and for my grandchildren's generation. And I look around and I see what is happening to America today, and it causes me to weep. I'm not an alarmist. I'm a realist. And I can see, friend, we used to look at America, and we see things changing maybe every year or every two or three years. There'd be something drastic that would happen in America, and we'd look around and we'd say, how in the world did that happen? But it seems like today that America is changing daily, and sometimes even hourly. It is a push to try to kick God out of America. I've said oftentimes that it would be better for a nation to never know God than to know God and then turn her back upon God. And that's what we're doing in this great land. Oftentimes in the Bible, God would deal with entire nations. Psalms 1434, righteousness exalted the nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. He says in Psalm 9 and verse 17, the wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. God is concerned about the condition of nations. And I believe he's greatly and gravely concerned this morning about the condition of America. And, he, and a prophet writes about Israel, and he writes about Jerusalem when he says, I brought you into a plentiful country, but when you entered it, you defiled my land, and you made my heritage an abomination. I'm here to tell you today that America was built upon a great foundation. America was built upon godly principles principles, the Judeo-Christian principles of the Word of God. But I'm also here to tell you this morning that we're giving the heritage that has been given to us to our enemy. Our history, our heritage goes back uh, even beyond the Declaration of Independence, beyond the Constitutional Convention. It even goes beyond the Pilgrims and the Puritans to a period of over 500 years ago with a man by the name of Chris or Christopher Columbus. If your name is Chris 
Well, Christopher, your name means Christ bearer. Well, I carry Christ. Where did it all begin? Over 500 years ago, America's built more Bible-believing churches than any other nation on the face of the earth, has sent out more Bible-believing missionaries to the rest of the world than any other nation on the face of the earth, and it began over 500 years ago. Columbus wrote one book. There's a copy of that book in the British Museum in London. I've been there. I've seen it in the enclosed case. I'm going to quote to you this morning from the English translation of his book, and these are the words of Christopher Columbus concerning his discovery of this part of the world, and I quote, It was the Lord who put in my mind to sail from Spain to the Indies. I could feel His hand upon me. All who heard my project rejected it with laughter and ridicule against me. There is no doubt that my inspiration to sail came from the Holy Ghost of God, because He comforted me with a ray of illumination from the Holy Scriptures, encouraging me to sail on till I found the country." End of quote. Now, what makes that quote so unusual? Most of the scholars, educators, and scientists of Columbus Day believed that the earth was flat. They actually believed that if you went out in the ocean far enough, you would fall off at the end of the earth. But for some reason, Columbus didn't believe that. You know why? He was a Bible student. And the Bible declares in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse number 22 that the earth is a circle. If the scholars and the educators and the scientists of Columbus Day would have read the Bible and believed the Bible, they would have saved themselves a lot of ignorance. And if the scholars and the educators and the scientists of our day would read the Bible and believe the Bible, they too would save themselves a lot of ignorance. In my opinion, it's just as ridiculous in 2015 to believe in evolution as it was for them to believe that the earth was flat. They taught evolution when I went to school, but they taught it as a theory. They don't teach children today that evolution is a theory. They teach it as a fact. And what are the facts of evolution? Eons and eons and eons and light years ago, nobody knows when, nobody knows where, nobody knows why, and nobody knows how. And those are the facts. <laughs> I was a tadpole when I began to begin. Next I was a frog with my tail tucked in. Then I was a monkey in a coconut tree, and now I'm a man with a Ph.D. <laughs> Fell in South Texas said, boy, it takes a lot of faith for you Christians to believe that stuff in the Bible about creation. Friend, it takes a whole lot more faith to believe in evolution than it does to believe the Word of God. Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God, you say, where did God come from? Anywhere He wanted to, He's God. And he said, let us make man in our own image. And he took out the dust of the earth, and he made man, and he breathed in his nostrils, and man became a living soul. I don't have any trouble with that. You know why? Because it's the Word of God. So it was not good for man to be alone, took a rib from Adam's side and made the woman. I have no difficulty with that. Why? Because it's the Word of God. America's history is rich, and God has been in America's history ever since the beginning. Then came the Pilgrims in the 1620s, and then came the Puritans in the 1630s. There were no skyscrapers, there were no interstate highways, there was no factory buildings, nothing but a vast wilderness and freedom. And they wanted that freedom, and they were willing to pay the price for that freedom. Fifty-six brave men put their name on that declaration of independence. John Hancock a little larger than the others. They asked him why his name was bigger. He said, I understand the king's getting old, and he doesn't see as well as he used to see. I don't want there to be no doubt that that paper goes back across the waters that they know my name. Those were the kind of men that started this country. Those were the kind of people that built America. They began to build a nation. They had a plan. They were dedicated to the radical proposition that all men are created in equal, that they were endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, including life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Not happiness, but the pursuit of happiness. And just how do you pursue happiness? You get a job and you go to work. You earn a living. You sweat a little bit. 
The government today wants to reward those who don't work and punish those who do work. And uh, we have more people on disability, more people on welfare, more people on food stamps in America today than ever before. Look up here today, young people. I am 65 years old. I'm in a wheelchair without the two legs that I lost to a landmine. I should have been killed. That landmine ripped both of my legs off of my body. And uh, most of my, a lot of my hearing is gone, all, nearly all of it in my right ear. I've ha had four stents put in my heart. I've had both of my shoulders reconstructed that my wrist reconstructed, but I am up here today pursuing happiness. I'm not wanting you to feel sorry for me. I'm up here doing what God has called me to do. I'm going to be at the football game to do an event on Saturday, then I'm driving to Lenore City and uh, speaking in Lenore City, Tennessee, and then on Monday I'm going to another event in Tennessee, and then on uh, two radio interviews on Monday and Tuesday, and then going to Murfreesboro, Tennessee for a big uh, citywide event, and then uh, that same day I'm flying home and speak to uh, uh, Dallas that evening at 7 o'clock. What are you doing? I'm pursuing happiness, and I'm having a great time doing it. I suggest you do the same thing. America was built upon a solid foundation. Other nations and countries built upon communism and socialism and anti-God and sinking sand and dictators. America is built upon the principles and the beliefs of God's Word and prayer. The Boston Tea Party, those people of their day were heroes. And we have a new party, and now they're ridiculed and made fun of and, 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 and talked about. And all they want to do is put God back in America. All they want to do is preserve the very liberties and the very freedoms that our forefathers fought to give you and I. Let me give you something from our heritage really quick. Some of you aren't going to believe what I'm about to tell you. You can look it up for yourself. This is our heritage. In 1683. The Rhode Island Charter, one of the more liberal states in our country today, in 1683, this is from the Rhode Island Charter, and I quote, We submit our persons, lives, and estates unto our Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, to all those perfect and most absolute laws of His given us in His holy word. That is God in America's history. 1701, Pennsylvania Charter by William Penn, and I quote, all persons who profess to believe in Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, shall be capable to serve this government in any capacity, both legislatively and executively, executively, end of quote, God in America's history. George Washington said, it is impossible to rightly govern the world without God and the Bible. All through the Scripture, we find, ref all through our country's history, we find references to God and references to the Bible. One of the greatest vacations that Connie and I ever took was to Washington, D.C. And uh, our children were just the right age to be able to understand it. We didn't ride any roller coasters. There wasn't anything exciting. Well, we did take a couple exciting rides in taxi cabs. That was about it. But we saw that week in God in America's history. Uh, let, let me just give you a couple here real quickly. Uh, in, the, in the Washington Monument, uh, at, at the top of that monument, uh, well, matter of fact, all throughout that monument is uh, a scripture that is inscribed in marble, but at the very top, engraved on the aluminum uh, capstone is Latin phrase laos dos, which means praise be to God. That's at the very top of our Washington Monument. Listen to me, our forefathers weren't trying to kick God out of America. They wanted God in America. And, and then lining the walls uh, are carved tribute blocks that refer to such biblical phrases as, quote, holiness to the Lord. And then uh, the, uh, another one, the memory of the just is blessed. And then even this one, Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. These are Scripture verses in the Washington Monument, in our nation's capital. Uh, uh, where our House and Senate does our nation's business is the inscription, In God We Trust. Also, 
the house chamber above the gallery door stands a marble relief of Moses, surrounded by 22 other lawgivers. At the east entrance of the Senate chamber are the words anointed copious, which is Latin for he hath favored our undertakings. The words in God we trust are also written over the southern interest. Now listen to me, friend. Our forefathers weren't talking about the God of the Muslim, the God of the Hindu, the God of the Buddha. They were talking about the God of this Bible. The God of this book and our forefathers believed uh, in our God. In the rotunda is the painting of the baptism of Pocahontas and also is the embarkation of the pilgrims that shows the pilgrims praying on shipboard led by William Brewster. And clearly seen is an open Bible and, and are the words, the New Testament according to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You can walk into the Capitol building this very day and see those words. Now the way things are going, I don't know how much longer it will stand. I'm telling you today, God is all over. I don't have time to give you the rest of this morning, but our nation was founded upon biblical principles, and our forefathers weren't trying to kick God out of anything. Our forefathers wanted God in America, and I believe that is one reason why God has blessed this nation, most blessed nation on the face of the earth. But I also believe that there's a thin thread that is holding back the full judgment of God. We have been the best friend that Israel has ever had. We've been their friend. We've been there for them. And now it looks like we're backing away from them. My friend, that would be the worst thing that we could possibly do. America needs to continue to be a friend to Israel and continue to stand with Israel unless we want the full judgment of God on this country. I am. I am greatly burdened today about America. There's so much more that I could say and that I want to say time will not allow. But I want to tell you, young people, I'm begging you all over this room for you to get a burden for your nation like you've never had before. I'll tell you up front that I do, I do believe that, that no election is going to save America. Democratic Party isn't going to save America. Republican Party isn't going to save America. And the independents aren't going to save America. I do believe you ought to be registered to vote, and I believe you ought to vote. Don't come and tell me how much you love America if you don't vote. I don't want to hear it. You say, well, I don't know. You say, well, I don't know who to vote for. Well, if you'll come and see me, I'll help you with that, all right? <laughs> and, uh, but our hope is not in a political party, and our hope is not in Washington, D.C. Our hope is in God. And the real hope that we have today is real, genuine, Holy Ghost, God-sent revival to come to our churches and our homes and our schools and to our neighborhoods and for, and for God to once again begin to receive glory and honor where we can actually sing God bless America and actually mean it the way that it should be. On March the 8th, 1971, one thirty in the afternoon, I stepped on a 60-pound mine, my head in the lap of Corporal Lee Gore. I begged God that day to let me live. I was saved at the age of 10, but as a teenager I had become quite rebellious and far, far away from God. It took a landmine explosion and two legs in a wheelchair for the rest of my life for me to finally say, okay God, I'll do what you want me to do. Numerous operations, eight months in a hospital in Philadelphia, but God spared my life. Pastored for five years in Southern Illinois, now my 37th year as an evangelist, and I don't want to do anything else. This is my life. But today, when I leave this platform, my prayer is going to be that some in this room, maybe not all, but some of you will seriously begin to get a burden for your nation like you've never had. I'm talking about weeping over America and praying over America, maybe like you've never had. And let us begin to take America back alley by alley. And street by street and town by town and city by city till we can once again say, one nation under God. Thank you for letting me be here today. This is the most awesome group to speak to. God bless you and God bless America.